So good evening, everybody. Um, for some reason, David can't join us, but um, you're all most welcome. Um, we are privileged to have Professor Evran Balta to give a presentation on her special subject, um, which is um, the, the long and complicated relations between Turkey and Russia. Um, so she's a professor of international relations at Öz Yayin University in Istanbul. And she's the co-author of the American Passport in Turkey, National Citizenship in the Age of Transnationalism, published 2020. Um, this book was the winner of the American Sociological Association Global and Transnational Society Sociology Section's Best Book by an International Scholar Award. Her research areas include transnational identities, populism and domestic sources of international relations. She has published extensively on Turkish foreign policy and Russian-Turkish relations. So, Evren Balta, the floor is yours. Thank you. Thank you for having me here tonight. I'm really honored to be uh, with you. Um, and thanks for the nice introduction. Um, what I'm going to be doing tonight is that I'm going to be talking about, as it was announced, on Russian-Turkish relations. But I'm and um, in the announcement, uh, it was said that I'm going to be talking about the more, um, um, I mean, focusing on what's going on today. But I start a little bit focusing on the history and how the historical patterns have shaped this, the identities and the relationship between these two states. Very briefly, though, but then I'll, uh, after that, I'll be moving uh, to uh, the more contemporary period. And as you know, uh, what really shaped the identities of both states is their imperial traditions, both empires, that these two states were both empires, and both empires collapsed at the end of the 19th, beginning of the 20th century, but their fates are significantly diverged. As you all know, our Ottoman Empire dismantled uh, but Bolsheviks managed to build another vast empire. Uh, they built an internationalist regime offering an alternative to the West. Uh, Turkish regime, on the other end, um, uh, followed another path of westernization. Uh, mostly, we could, uh, I mean, we can claim that it was an integration. Uh, the Western uh, security and architecture, or capitalist integration, you could, you could say, uh, with status tunes. But at the end, uh, the imperial collapse um, in, in both cases have created anxieties over the West-led international order. And this anxiety pretty much was a very significant theme in the security culture of both states throughout the 20th century. And it still is an important dimension of the security culture of these states. As I said, uh, their anti-Westernism hugely differed throughout the 20th century, but I think that the anti-Westernist tones of both states have become quite and even strikingly similar um, since the last decade or so. Um, plus, the, the, this prevailing theme of anti-Westernism, uh, you also have a similar security culture in both states. Uh, sometimes in the case of Turkey, we uh, label it as the Sev syndrome, uh, and it is an anxiety over territorial, uh, in, uh, territorial integrity. Uh, they uh, both share a similar element. Culture, and I could call this elite culture as a conspiratorial elite culture, which is tightly linked to this idea of or to, the, to this anxiety of a territorial disintegration. And both states believe that they live in a country made of glass. So they're, I mean, they have anxieties over their territorial borders, territorial integrities, and this and that. And this is, again, a very much prevailing theme of their uh, security cultures throughout the 20th century and even now. Um, and 
I also, I also want to mention this fact that the Soviet Union has always, even during the Cold War, except maybe in the 1950s, where Turkish foreign policy had uh, this um, very strong anti-American tone, except that period uh, in the 1950s, uh, Soviet Union was a partner of Turkey for trade and economic cooperation, as I said, even during the Cold War. Uh, there were constant interaction and visits. And the Turkish foreign policy never fully excluded cooperation with the Soviet Union, even in the heyday of the Cold War. Uh, Turkey's, uh, and in the beginning of the Turkey's modernization efforts, I mean, planning, development, modernization in Turkey, they all had a, a very significant Soviet influence. Um, uh, what I mean, th these are some similarities that I want to mention. I mean, if you have any questions, we, we can talk later on. Uh, but I also want to talk about a little bit about some uh, patterns during the Cold War. Um, in the nine problems, the first problems with the Soviet Union and Turkey emerged after the Soviet notification of March uh, 1945 to Turkey. And that notification was that the Treaty of Friendship, which was uh, signed in the beginning of the Turkish Republic in the early days of the 1920s, would not be extended. And after that letter, uh, Turkey also notified and learned that and this is sort of a debate in the Turkish uh, Turkish foreign in the, within the Turkish foreign policy, uh, and, but uh, uh, but there was this uh, claim that uh, Soviets uh, wanted to have uh, Turkish wanted to have more control over the Turkish Straits, and they had objections to Montreux, and they also had territorial demands and in Kars, Ardahan, and Batum. As I said, we still don't know if this is a myth or reality, but it doesn't matter. This has become a foundational aspect of Turkish foreign policy in the second half of the 20th century. Soviets has this expansionist claims or aims or territorial claims on Turkey. Whatever it is, uh, the, the uh, control of the Straits uh, has always been, and the control within the, the control of the Black Sea has always been an important issue between Turkey and the and Soviet Union and now Russia. And I'll come back to this idea. I mean, it still is one of the important components of the bilateral relationship. And again, as you know, uh, Turkey joined uh, to NATO in 1952. Uh, the decade followed of the Turkey joining of the NATO has been the most pro-American period of Turkish foreign policy. And as I said previously, this was the period where Turkish and so Turkish and Soviet Union, the relationship between Turkey and the Soviet Union really deteriorated. Um, and as you know, anti-communism has been again, has been also a very important foundational aspect of Turkish foreign policy throughout the Cold War as well. And but as I said, this was not uh, something that prevented Turkey and the Soviet Union uh, to develop economic relations. Uh, to de develop trade relations or for Soviets uh, uh, to, um, uh, to send development aid to Turkey. And in fact, when you look at the Soviet gross disbursement to non-socialist developing countries between starting from 1965 to 1980s, the money that's sent to Turkey is even more than the total of the Soviets sending to Africa or Middle East. Uh, Turkey has been one of the primary recipients of the Soviet Union starting from 1965. So what I'm trying to say, to make the very long story short, uh, Turkey and the Soviet Union, even during the Cold War, had a functioning uh, bilateral relationship. This was basically a result of Turkey's balancing policy. Turkey has never, even during the Cold War, even when Turkey was a member of the uh, NATO alliance, uh, never let go of the Soviet Union as a result of this balancing policy and as a result of this uh, deep suspicions, probably you could say, uh, of the Western intentions. 
what else uh, we can say? So, I mean, very briefly, these are some of the patterns, uh, historical patterns that I can mention, uh, which I think uh, are significant in understanding the contemporary, the current bilateral relations between uh, Turkey um, and Russia. Uh, maybe one more fact that I can mention, uh, for example, uh, the, the relationship between Turkey and the Soviet Union uh, was really um, intensified after the Turkey's intervention to Cyprus. And this is also another pattern of Turkey uh, and the relationship, the bilateral relations between uh, these two countries have been, I mean, the pattern of the bilateral relationships between these two countries. Whenever um, Turkey's or the Soviet Union's or right now Russia's um, has this hesitations or suspicions from all the conflicts with the vast-led international order, they always turn to each other. Um, this is something that has been going on, as I said, uh, in the last decade uh, between Russia and Turkey. Similar pattern emerged. Um, so this is, as I said, very briefly, the historical pattern between Turkey, uh, historical pattern of the bilateral relations. Uh, the relations between Turkey and Russia changed in the 1990s, once again, after the uh, collapse of the Soviet Union, after the end of the Cold War. Uh, what we have experienced in the 1990s, again, you all know that uh, a weak Russia, uh, in terms of state capacity, in terms of institutional capacity, in terms of economic capacity. Uh, so uh, Turkey has been uh, offered uh, as a model Caucasus and Central Asia. And again, uh, Turkey has become a very influential uh, actor in the region. And uh, there was basically a competition um, in the Turkic world and Turkey has between Russia and Turkey. And Turkey was using this idea of from Adriatic to China, the Turkic world, I mean, building the Turkic world uh, kind of idea. Uh, so it was also an expansionist period, an assertive period in Turkish foreign policy. That was the most tense period between uh, of Turkish-Russian bilateral relations uh, 1990s. Uh, there were lots of problems. Uh, uh, the problem of Armenia, uh, the problem of Nagorno-Karabakh really created lots of tensions between Turkey and Russia. Uh, the presence in the Black Sea also created lots of tensions. Uh, again, the question of uh, NATO presence in the Black Sea also created tensions in the 1990s. Energy transmission projects, pipeline construction projects, these were also a source of tensions in the 1990s. Turkey wanted to be a hub uh, to the of the Central Asian and, and Caucasian uh, energy uh, to the West. And, and, and in that period really created uh, this project of um, energy pipelines as an alternative to the Russian energy transfer to the West. So the, the projects of vast, uh, energy transmission, uh, the Russian project of energy transmission and the Turkey's project of energy transmission was competing projects back in the 1990s. This changed in the 2000s. Uh, Turkey became more, uh, uh, accommodative of the Russian interests um, in, in energy, in its presence in Central Asia, in Caucasus, and so on and so forth, as I said, in the 1990s. One of the most important problems between Russia and Turkey in the 1990s was the problem of Chechnya and the PKK. Uh, very similar to what Turkey uh, is feeling right now towards its Western allies. Back then, Turkey was feeling against Russia. Uh, so Turkey was uh, accusing Russia continuously about uh, um, harboring the PKK and helping the PKK. And Russia was accusing Turkey in uh, helping. Uh, this would also change uh, in, the 19, in 1999 uh, with the uh, signing of the anti-terror agreements now, I don't exactly remember the um, the title of the agreement, but they say, signed an agreement and they uh, actually stated in the agreement that they won't be harboring each other's enemies anymore. So kind of uh, this uh, mutual and understanding that they tried to create uh, at the end of the 1990s really made a significant contribution in the development of Russian relations. Uh, so this was the 1990s, but when we come to 2000s, uh, 
uh, both the global, regional, and domestic dynamics of domestic domestic dynamics of Turkish-Russian relations have significantly evolved and changed. So, whenever we want to understand this bilateral relationship, we always have to situate it in the global. Um, balance of power dynamics. Um, this relationship, as I always call, is a triangle, not a bilateral relationship, it's always dominated, shaped, and affected by the Western presence. And even in the 19th century, in the 20th century, it, it has been shaped by this anxiety towards Western presence or Western intentions. Uh, it has been shaped by the security cultures of these two countries in which the idea of West uh, plays a dominant uh, role. Um, and as I said, globally, uh, the dynamics of balance of power has been changing in the 2000s. Uh, major developments happen. Uh, you all know that, and I don't have to, uh, I'm, I'm not going to go over all of them, but just to mention um, some. Uh, 2001, um, uh, American intervention, American invasion of Iraq. Uh, 2008, economic crisis. 2011, Arab revolts. And 2016, Trump presidency. All of them, all these moments, all these events, really in their own way, uh, shaped um, Russian-Turkish rela relations uh, because it shaped the regional power dynamics. But at the end, if I have to say just one sentence about how these four different events shaped uh, Russian-Turkish relations, is that, this, they, that they all really uh, contributed to this idea that these states began to believe that we are basically movi moving towards a post-Western world order. Uh, so the um, 2001 and Iraqi invasion really created this subsequent withdrawal uh, of America from the Middle East. You can add to that shale revolution, uh, the, uh, the, the change in the need for uh, Middle Eastern oil for America, this and that. But at the end, we ended up, when we come to 2011 or 2010, less American presence in the Middle East and, and a Western uh, security system less interested in the Middle East, less investing to the regional and Middle Eastern politics. 2008 economic crisis is also important in a sense, uh, um, both created, uh, or let me say differently, it really helped the states to, um, to strengthen in a way their economies. Specifically, this is true for Turkey because um, uh, a lot of foreign direct investment that these developing states began to attract. Russia um, uh, uh, was affected from the 2008 crisis initially in a very negative way, uh, but still this idea that this, both the economic crisis, political crisis that the West is going through uh, really helped uh, shaping um, this idea of uh, post battle order um, in the minds of the political elites of both countries. And, and, I, I, and I would say Trump presidency really uh, gave another push to that idea because then you have this, uh, this, this leader of the hegemonic actor, the, uh, America, uh, claiming that the West is not going to be acting anymore as it used to act, is not going to present is not going, was not, I mean, not being present globally anymore. So that's one. So the global power dynamics, have, and you have sort of a vacuum um, in the region, in the Middle East, and, and, and that vacuum uh, made this, uh, these two states, not just these two states, uh, a couple of, uh, several of other regional states too, um, power brokers, uh, order setting actors. Uh, they became, as uh, as you may all know again, in, from Syria to Libya, uh, I mean, and I'm using uh, order here in, in quotation marks, uh, but they created, whether we like or not, a functioning, relatively stable, uh, sort of an order, and they uh, are the political actors, um, um, and they uh, basically helped each other in creating that again, uh, quote in quotation marks, um, order. 
they needed alliances. Uh, they needed alliances to balance other regional actors. They needed alliances uh, to counter their own, um, or how to say, um, to counter uh, the transnational threats that they are facing uh, in the region. And I think that's also an important component of the emerging alliance between Turkey and Russia. Uh, for Turkey, uh, one of the major components or, or the factors that pushed Turkey and Turkish foreign policy towards Russia is Kurdish transnationalism. And this is also, again, uh, something probably you have heard over and over. It's always in the news. It's in the news right now uh, because of the um, Sweden's and Finland's uh, NATO membership. Uh, so the, uh, the Turkey uh, had this um, uh, grievance uh, with its Western allies uh, that it was left alone uh, towards Kurdish transnationalism, uh, specifically in Syria. Uh, so, uh, I mean, um, in several times, repeatedly, in fact, asked for a safe zone um, or asked for this and that uh, to uh, counter Kurdish transnationalism. Uh, but again, repeatedly, for uh, reasons that I'm not going to be mentioning, uh, uh, it, I mean, uh, Turkish elites didn't get what they, or the Turkish uh, president, uh, or the Turkish governing party didn't get uh, what they asked for from the Western allies. Uh, so when we come to 2014, uh, what Turkey was experiencing is an increase in Kurdish transnationalism. And uh, after the 2016, um, you also have a, a coup attempt added to this um, domestic uh, feeling of instability and insecurity. And Turkey increasingly turned its face towards Russia as an ally to counter uh, these two threats, I mean, uh, which are both domestic with a sort of a transnational external uh, dimension. Uh, that was, uh, that was, as I said, a very clear um, mo motivation for Turkey to uh, have this alignment uh, with Russia after 2016. And you also have, from if you look at from the Russian side, the major threat perception of Russia is Islamic transnationalism, similar to the um, Americans. Uh, but uh, for Russians, aligning with Russia, uh, with Turkey in Syria uh, really created security benefits in terms of uh, controlling uh, the transnational Islamic actors in Syria. So their threat perceptions, domestic and external, really differed, but they needed each other uh, to sort of create, a, to create sort of, a, again, quote unquote, an order in the region. Um, I can add some other dynamics uh, to this. Um, I mean, for example, race similarity is also an important component of this alignment. And when, when I say regime similarity, uh, I am basically referring to the decision-making processes uh, in both countries. And these two leaders uh, have difficulty in understanding uh, that the uh, some other countries, specifically democratic countries and Western countries, the executives are constrained. Uh, constrained by parliaments, bureaucracies, foreign policy, elites, and this and that, or lobbyists. Uh, so um, in, in their case, however, uh, their interaction is not constrained. When they promise about some, they actually uh, go forward and do that. And that creates an important dynamic in, 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 in this bilateral relationship. Um, I mean, whenever we, for example, in international relations, we have this theory called democratic peace theory. And uh, we argue that democracies don't fight with each other if they are consolidated democracies, of course. Uh, and one of the uh, explanations of why democracies don't fight with each other, we basically say that it's because of regime similarity, because they understand how they work, it's transparent, they are that the democracies are constrained, they understand that they are public, uh, does not want uh, their states to go in length divorce and this and that. Uh, so uh, this similarity really creates a sort of a peace dynamic. And in the case of these two states, 
uh, this regime similarity uh, really created this functioning relationship, leadership-based diplomacy, and 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 many many other things. Uh, so this is another component uh, I, I would say uh, in turn which which shaped the bilateral relations of um, Turkey and Russia. And uh, this is something I mentioned before, uh, but let me mention it, it again. Um, Anti-Westernism has become a political strategy for both states, uh, specifically in after 2014 for uh, Russia, 2016 for Turkey, uh, 2014 is the Crimean invasion, 2016 is the coup attempt in Turkey. Uh, it, I mean, anti-Westernism was already there, but it has become a very exclusive, a very important uh, pronounced uh, um, instrument of political rule in both states. That is also a dynamic that really um, made this two, I mean, brought these two state security cultures uh, together. So these are some, some, some dimensions of Turkish-Russian relations uh, in the 2000s that shaped the Turkish-Russian relations in 2000s. But maybe I can talk a little bit about economic leverage and energy uh, relationship between Turkey and Russia, because that is also an important um, uh, When we look at the economic uh, relations in 2019, uh, Russia was second only after Germany in the list of Turkey's top trading partners with a trade a uh, volume of more than uh, $30 billion. Uh, so the trade between uh, Russia and Turkey um, is really huge. Um, uh, and uh, the sectors, uh, if I, I mean, excluding energy right now, um, the sectors, uh, the important sectors in economic ship between Turkey and Russia are construction sector. Uh, Russia is the Turkey's number one partner in construction. 20% of Turkey's foreign investment is in Russia, in the construction sector. Uh, tourism sector, again, a major sector of Turkey, uh, really uh, in terms of, um, I mean, economic growth and exchange, uh, exchange and, and all those things. I mean, tourism is really very important. Uh, for Turkey and Russia is the number one partner. Uh, the second is, I guess, uh, Ukraine is maybe third or second. Uh, I'm not sure, but Russia is the first. I mean, um, Ukraine is either second or third. And finally, we have, uh, there is, uh, Turkey is also um, a lot of agricultural uh, cooperation in, uh, in between these two countries. Um, that's very similar to the uh, Russian European trade uh, in terms of grain and fertilizers. And um, as we all know, the rising food prices in an already hyper, I mean, in, I mean, Turkey has a very hyperinflationist period right now and rising food prices has a huge effect even before the war uh, on Turkey's economy. Uh, so uh, what else I can say about uh, economy? I think uh, pretty much this. Uh, but the most important component of economic relationship uh, between Russia and Turkey is energy, of course. Uh, this, this is again, similar to, uh, uh, to, uh, to European-Russian relations, uh, where the energy is uh, really the most important component uh, that shapes this relationship. This is also important in a sense. Our, uh, Russia uh, has begun to use energy as a geopolitical instrument. Uh, this is not new. It has been the case since 2002. Uh, and the, the problems since the start of the problems with the Ukraine, if you remember, there was this long winter, uh, Russia uh, to cut the gas uh, of Ukraine. Um, so in the last 20 years, uh, I mean, energy has become uh, through nationalization of the energy sector, uh, through uh, investments to the uh, strategic um, sectors. I mean, energy really has become a very much a geopolitical instrument of Russia. And Turkey's, I mean, 50% of Turkey's natural gas is coming from Russia. This is huge. And given the fact that uh, Turkey is globally in the last 
20 years um, is the second country after China with um, with the, with I mean uh, whose energy needs increase tremendously uh, because of its rapid economic growth uh, and so on and so forth. As and a majority of the Turkey's economic development and growth was basically filled uh, by Russian energy, uh, by Russian natural gas. Uh, so uh, that's an important fact. But it is not just the natural gas, but 24% of Turkey's oil and 40% of Turkey's coal is also coming from Russia. So Turkey is energy dependent to Russia. And that's pretty much a very asymmetrical relationship. Although our asymmetrical relationship is kind of, um, um, I mean, sort of more symmetrical when you consider this fact, Turkey is Russia's second biggest gas client after Germany. Yeah. Um, so similar to, again, German-Russian relationship, uh, Germans needed Russia, Russians needed German, German needed, I mean, let me say again, Germans needed Russian natural gas, but Russians also needed German to buy their natural gas. And you could basically say think uh, for Turkey too, because uh, Turkey, as I said, is Russia's second biggest gas client. Uh, its economy is huge, its, uh, its market is huge. Uh, so it's not just Turkey depending on Russian gas, but Russia is depending on Turkey buying its gas as well. Um, uh, what else I can say in terms of energy? Huh. Uh, maybe energy transportation, uh, that's also an important component. I mentioned it very briefly in the 1990s. Turkey and of these competing projects. Uh, Russia wanted to transfer its gas either directly or uh, through Ukraine uh, to Europe. Um, and Turkey wanted um, uh, Central Asian and Caucasian Caspian gas uh, as an alternative to the Russian gas. Uh, but as I said, when we come to 2000s, uh, Turkey became very accommodative of Russian energy transfer, uh, trans, uh, transit demands, energy transmission demands, and also uh, uh, began to uh, uh, begin to construct a uh, Turk Stream, uh, which was opened uh, two years ago. Uh, a year ago, I'm losing my time here. Uh, very recently, uh, one of the important uh, uh, corridors that makes uh, uh, that Turkey hope to make Turkey uh, an energy hub between uh, Europe and 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 Russia. Um, what else? Um, uh, so, uh, Turkey is also in terms of energy depends on Russia in its nuclear energy too, uh, because again, you may know Turkey's first nuclear power plant is being built, which is now question mark because of the sanctions, uh, sanctions put over uh, the bank that's uh, currently financing uh, the nuclear po uh, power plant. Uh, but um, uh, uh, but it's the agreement is still uh, with Russia. I mean, um, so in terms of its nuclear energy, uh, Turkey is also dependent on uh, Russia too. Um, that's uh, maybe one important thing is to consider is that uh, whether this is going to be changing not soon probably, as it's happening in Europe as well. Um, energy diversification is uh, on the table uh, for Turkey. Uh, LNG, uh, other nuclear, uh, other um, agreements or collaboration uh, for the construction of uh, nuclear power plants um, or um, diversifying um, uh, Russian gas by Central Asian and Caucasian gas or maybe um, becoming right now, once again, a hub for the transmission or to transit Central Asian and Caucasian gas to Europe. So there are alternative projects on the table and right now Turkey is considering to uh, decrease its dependence on Russian energy. Uh, it was on the table, in fact, even before the uh, Russian invasion of Ukraine, uh, it is, I mean, I cannot say significantly, but a, a, a little bit of uh, Turkey's dependence, I mean, a little bit incre uh, decreased uh, in the last two years um, through Azerbaijani gas and 
and also um, uh, Turkmen gas and, 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 and LNG as well. Uh, okay. Um, all these things that I explained, I know uh, it used to be when, we, when I talked about a Turkish Russian relationship, uh, what attracted the most attention was Turkey's purchase of S 400s uh, from Russia, which really created fissures and tensions uh, between uh, Turkey, between Turkey and the United States. And uh, Turkey kept repeating that this is uh, something that um, under Turkey's um, jurisdiction, sovereignty, autonomy. Uh, so, and Turkey also kept accusing its Western allies not selling um, um, uh, uh, missiles. And, and, and probably you all know uh, this debate. Um, and this is one of the most popular uh, debates in Russian Turkish relations. Um, this this whole uh, framework that I tried to explain here, um, this, this idea of um, uh, creating an order sort of together in the region, uh, becoming uh, partners in, 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 in the in sustainable, uh, even though uh, they have a sort of a competitive dynamic in some other uh, regions like Libya, uh, they sort of, I mean, these two countries or the leaders of these two countries thought that uh, they created a functioning relationship. And in fact, a prominent Russian policymaker, foreign policy bureaucrat, told me that when I was interviewing him, uh, the Russian-Turkish relationship is the this is the exemplary relation or the model relationship should be the model relationship of the 21st century. Uh, meaning that he was basically referring to this idea uh, that you have um, civil alliance, you have basically interests, uh, you are not in this fixed uh, rigid alliances, uh, you help each other when you need each other, you go and ally with other countries uh, when uh, your interests diverge, but you have a functioning understanding, uh, you keep trading, um, and, um, and, and you, you, so, you sometimes have these minor conflicts, but you do not go to a total war. Let me just say a couple of words and stop here, then Maybe in the Q&A, um, I can uh, expand some of the themes that I discussed here, and we can also discuss uh, what is going on right now. Let me give you some um, some uh, thoughts on what's going on right now, or what will be changing uh, with the Russian invasion of Ukraine. Uh, I talked about security, economy, energy, and domestic politics with a normative dimension. In terms of security, uh, Turkey had, again, uh, ties to, I mean, Turkey has been trying to follow this balance uh, or, uh, as you know uh, from Turkey, playing this role of an intermediary uh, between Russia and Ukraine, between Russia and the West, in fact, you could say. Um, uh, Turkey thinks that it gives a uh, Turkey uh, foreign policy a little bit more autonomy in terms of dealing with Russia uh, in a way that Turkey doesn't have to um, uh, to uh, to um, join to the Western sanctions and and um, and many more keep trading with Russia and this and that. Um, so this, I think. The question here is that whether this is a sustainable position or not. And uh, as the war drags, uh, it becomes less of a sustainable position. But at the same time, as war drags, um, within the Western alliance, maybe there is a need or uh, there is a need for an actor to talk to Russians or to be able to talk to Russians. So this is an open debate. Still open debate, I would say. Um, in terms of NATO enlargement, we can also talk about that. That's again an important component. I think uh, Turkey is now using it as a negotiation tool uh, to convince uh, the NATO members and Western allies uh, that its uh, problems with uh, PKK, PYD uh, is real and there, and uh, NATO has uh, more to say uh, uh, for that. And this 
has a, 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 something that Turkish political leaders has been very vocal. Not it's not new. Has been very vo vocal in the last uh, decade. Um, uh, one of the important components is that this order that uh, Turkey and Russia, again in quotation marks, created in the region, uh, maybe collapsing. Maybe the role of Iran. Uh, is increasing in Syria. Uh, so uh, that is also something that we should discuss uh, with the partial of the uh, Russians from Syria. Uh, the Americans and the West doesn't want to see Iran becoming stronger uh, in, in Syria. So Turkey may again act the role of a balancer uh, there. And we may think of this um, new um, uh, intervention uh, uh, projects, proposals in the light of this dimension as well. Uh, in terms of economy, uh, Turkey is basically using this moment, it seems, uh, because lots of uh, textile firms, as the uh, textile firms are withdrawing, Western textile firms like Zara, Mango, withdrawing from Russia, all this... Um, uh, textile firms of Turkey, um, Ipekyol, Roman, uh, Mudo is opening branches uh, right now in Russia. And Turkey is also uh, trying to attract the FDI of the FDI in the region, top one. Uh, Turkey is now trying to attract FDI uh, withdrawing from Russia as well. Uh, but there are also long-term uh, consequences of this, uh, this war, uh, this invasion uh, in trade relations. We can talk about that uh, later on. Uh, some call it French shoring. Whether you are allied with Russia or not is going to is going to shape your uh, trade patterns. That's an important pattern to follow. Um, and domestically. Um, the, the problem here in Turkey is that there is a lot of sympathy to Ukraine, but there is a lot of um, negativism towards NATO or anti-NATO and anti-Americanism is very strong. So the government has to balance between two, these two dimensions. The opposition has to balance between these two dimensions of this, these two and also has to balance the um, balance with its allies. Uh, of its foreign policy or align its foreign policy. So that's a very difficult dynamic. And as I said, since it's a political instrument and anti-Westernism is now the political instrument of the government, uh, it's even more difficult uh, in such an environment. Uh, finally, everyone says that this is my last word. Uh, the, with the Russian invasion of uh, Ukraine uh, the in the initial Days, but whether this cleavage between democracy and authoritarianism or this, uh, this friction between democratic and authoritarian regimes is be becoming more stronger, shaping trade patterns, shaping uh, alliances and this and that has been the talk uh, of the town, uh, town be me being uh, the global security um, uh, think tanks and policy makers. And, uh, but I think it's, again, if you look at, I mean, Turkey is, is an interesting cap regard to follow uh, because uh, it's, not a, uh, it's, it's not a democratic country in a sense. It's still in the uh, Western alliance. It has connections with Russia. Uh, and it's, it's whether Turkey is pushed towards democracy uh, to remain uh, in the Western alliance. Um, and more, um, or um, whether Turkey uh, will be accepted as it is, as long as uh, it meets the security demands of the Western alliance, is going to be something or is going to be an interesting um, uh, pattern uh, to follow. Um, I'll stop here. I talked more than I promised. Uh, thank you. Thank you very much, Abraham, for your time and insightful analysis of the uh, complicated um, relations between Turkey and Russia. And um, to start the question and answer session, I, I've got a question. Um, but any friends who want to um, ask questions, 
either use a chat system or raise your hands or just jump in. So my question concerns the Black Sea. Um, obviously the Russia-Ukraine war is going on at uh, full force. And I believe Russia has just reopened Mariupol port. Mm -hmm. So, and it wishes to export not only its own grain, but mm -hmm. grain that it has captured from Ukraine territory as well. Mm -hmm. And the, Turkey and the Middle East requires this grain and probably will require it more and more. Um, so there's a complication of, will Turkey allow this grain to be shipped by Russian ships um, through the Straits because presumably they're then considered civilian ships. So Turkey doesn't, cannot use the Montreux Protocol to limit their transit. No. And no. so could you see a problem where the Western allies sort of say, no, no, you can't do that because that includes stolen grain as well. Um, and so would you be seeing Turkey having to make a difficult choice between being pleasing Russia in it, its own way it has done partly by blocking or temporarily blocking the Finnish and Swedish entry to NATO and at the same time trying to play the NATO card saying um yeah we, we still you know are with you type sort of thing mm -hmm. okay um but these are two different, different questions seemingly but as you said um uh, the rationale, maybe the mentality of the two questions or the framework, general framework that, or the general climate that will shape the answer to both questions is pretty much the same. Uh, so, and I always keep saying that but the, the Turkish will keep, um, will keep this autonomy uh, that it really derived. I mean, it really had uh, in the last decade or so uh, in the coming years or so no um i mean or in the coming months even um so right now um th there is not much pressure uh coming uh, towards turkey for example in this example uh, to blocking uh, the shipment of grains right uh and in fact it's a bit more, um um how to say less of a problem uh, compared to the uh, NATO expansion and Turkey's position towards NATO expansion because you need grain. Uh, people are, uh, the grain prices are getting higher. Uh, there will be um, a lot of uh, uh, problems um, uh, with the food prices and this and that, you know the problems. Um, uh, so, uh, and in fact, uh, Turkey has, be uh, trying to negotiate uh, the shipment of uh, grains both by Ukrainian ships and Russian ships. Um, so, and 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 I don't remember exactly when was that, uh, but like a week ago, uh, the foreign minister has said that Turkey will be the facilitator of the shipment of the grains uh, from the Ukrainian ports. Uh, so. Uh, so I'm, I mean, I'm not sure. I'm not seeing a sort of a pressure for Turkey to block that shipment coming from the Western countries. Um, in terms of, uh, and that's sort of an autonomy and that's also sort of a need. I mean, um, uh, the need for grains globally, regionally, um, I mean, pretty much this. Um, but in terms of uh, NATO expansion, uh, what I do see is that, and I said in my uh, presentation, um, I think all the outside actors are aware of the fact that even Sweden and Finland, uh, that Turkey is trying to negotiate its position in NATO, not actually trying to block or veto uh, Finland and Sweden eventually to NATO. Uh, but using it as a card uh, to negotiate. And even the opposition in Turkey right now is arguing that uh, this is not something that Turkey should not do, but the way that Turkey is doing it is wrong. Uh, I mean, openly uh, saying that we will be vetoing and blocking. Everyone is saying, even from the opposition forces, that you always do sort of this diplomatizations. Uh, 
uh, in these important moments, uh, which gives you um, a sort of an influence uh, over the process of things, over the um, over certain events. And you do those type of things, but you basically do it um, behind the closed doors. Uh, but the, the populist foreign policy style of Erdogan government uh, is, is this. He has never uh, done it behind the doors. Uh, his main um, uh, style is uh, having this direct connection uh, with his voters. Always saying that, okay, I'm telling you first. And I'm telling to the others next. So this this style is very much you could you could compare it um, with all the other populist leaders who are talking very directly to their electoral base, um, and also that politically helps uh, in bridging uh, this dilemma of the Turkish political actors that I just mentioned, uh, where you have this anti-NATO, anti-strong anti-NATO and anti-American sentiment, uh, and where you also have uh, this um, this sympathy to uh, Ukraine, and uh, it it brings these two uh, concerns together. We are basically uh, helping um, Ukraine to win this war. The government says, uh, sending and helping drones, arming Ukrainians, uh, staying in NATO, uh, saying yes to NATO expansion. But at the same time, we are negotiating our position. And finally, in terms of uh, NATO expansion, uh, as I said, um, uh, Turkey, and in fact, today, <laughs> you, you see, I just lost the track of time. Was it today or t yesterday or last week? So it, it was it, yesterday or today, Erdogan um, uh, had this piece in The Economist. Um, probably some of you read it, uh, where he basically says that um, the reason uh, for Turkey uh, vetoing and with a much softer tone, and this is this is what uh, th this is the style. I mean, uh, that we have been experiencing in a decade, in the last decade or so. Um, this is based. This is something he said. We have been pushing for a decade. We have been saying to the NATO that the threats have changed. Uh, NATO should not only be reading to the uh, interstate conflicts or uh, threats coming from other states, uh, but as we see, and NATO is in fact have changed its security concept uh, with regard to terror and included all these new threats in its strategic concepts in the uh, previous summits. Uh, and he was basically saying that you, this is this is our concern, and you have to sort of a, a broader understanding uh, of the trust coming from uh, the external borders of NATO and being uh, Turkey's borders in Syria. I am not sure if I make sense, but um, uh, so Turkey will ha always have this different position, and now um, it is sort of a moment. Um, the Turkish political elite thinks to press for that, and and I don't know. <laughs> I think I'll stop here. Okay. Um, just connected with that. Um, there's obviously a rising demand in Turkey to do an operation against mm -hmm. the Kurdish autonomous zone in northern Syria, mm -hmm. and um, the city of Kobane would be obviously one of the targets because that would that links the two areas of occup Turkish occupation in Syria. So, um, but of course, Kobani is symbolically very important, both for the Kurds as well as Americans, because that's when um, Obama um, assisted them because to prevent Kobani falling. And mm -hmm. interesting, Erdogan helped the Kurds initially by allowing the Peshmergas to come from Iraq to prevent ISIS from taking Kobane completely. So um, this had to go. I mean, wasn't yeah, willing. <laughs> obviously, things have changed a lot since then. But what I'm saying is, could Turkey use this opportunity of the Russian weakness right now, because Kobane is very um, poorly defended by Russian Syrian troops. It's not the American zone of control. So 
could Turkey sort of see this as a perfect opportunity to take Kobane, but presumably create um, a human suffering there, as the Kurds will obviously defend Kobane, mm. and therefore Turkey might lose um, the goodwill of the West right now, because um, the West might see this as a maybe a betrayal of their allies. So do you think they're, they're dangerous for Turkey right now as well? Sure. I mean, for many reasons. Uh, first of all, elections are coming, and we do know of uh, not just from uh, Turkey, but from uh, IR theory, from the from history that electoral periods are very dangerous periods in terms of um, conflicts, wars. I mean, political leaders, especially when they know that they're losing the electoral game, uh, they play this uh, really around to flat game. Um, so uh, this has been, again, uh, an important uh, debate uh, in Turkey, even before uh, this operation decision was taken, uh, that uh, there could be an operation for domestic reasons. Uh, this is one. Right? Uh, all the, the far, foreign policy of Turkey is highly connected to the domestic political calculations. Um, but also, as, as you said, you mentioned, um, Turkey uh, do things uh, with the withdrawal of Russia from Syria, uh, with the strengthening uh, or Iran becoming stronger in Syria, potentially. Uh, and Turkey is becoming more of an actor and the West would need Western Turkey's presence in Syria for many reasons. Right. So, okay, there are cured, there are human suffering and this and that, but what other actor is willing to uh, counter the Iranian influence uh, in Syria? Or what other actor is counter the Syri uh, Russian influence in Syria? So uh, the Kurds, okay, but they're not a major force um, of countering these two major states. Um, that is something Erdogan thinks strategically and racially as an opportunity. Uh, so that's one, uh, because the need for Turkey's presence, right? Uh, I mean, maybe I will lose the goodwill, but I'll get their support. Uh, maybe they'll talk about uh, human rights and democracy, this intervention not being legitimate and this and that, but they will support it somehow. They have to, sort of. Uh, so I think uh, this, this dilemma of the Western governments has been there um, for the last 10 years. In every intervention uh, that Turkey uh, done to Syria, it was the same dilemma. We do not know the extent uh, or the borders of the intervention. There are, these are still talks. I mean, um, whether Turkey has a capacity, whether Americans uh, will allow, whether there will be other negotiations between Russia and Turkey, between Americans and Turkey. I think negotiations are still going on. Uh, Turkey, uh, uh, again, either today or yesterday. Um, and now, uh, I mean, made uh, this um, uh, declaration that they uh, told Russians, uh, Turk, uh, I think it was the uh, foreign minister, uh, told uh, Russian counterparts that uh, this was something that Russians already promised to Turkey, uh, the safe zone, and they will not be uh, doing something other than that. Uh, so they are still trying to convince uh, Russians to the necessity of this operation, uh, still talking to the Americans. Uh, but also in terms of the Kurds, uh, I do think Kurds have become important allies for the Americans. Again, maybe for the same balancing reason too. Um, so these only, these, that Kurds are, are the only remaining actors uh, that the American government has uh, been using as the negotiation card as well uh, when they negotiate with Turks. Um, so um, multiple layers of negotiation, I would say, going on right now. And uh, the, these are really, I mean, um, periods of both danger and also um, from, uh, the, the, from the perspective of political elites, uh, these also provide ample of opportunities and to um, follow um, their long-held beliefs, desire, um, desires, and, um, and, and also given that um, 
I let me say that um, I had uh, been looking. I have been looking uh, to the public opinion surveys vis-a-vis uh, -vis Erdogan's foreign policy in the last six years. Um, this monthly public opinion surveys done by Conda, and uh, what you see is that. In, the, in this surveys, you see the polarization very clearly, like the opposition doesn't support Don's, uh, Syrian policy, and in fact, foreign policy in general. Um, and there's a lot of criticism and like partisanship. But when it comes to Kurds and uh, Turkey's presence in Syria because of Kurds, uh, you have a broad support. Um, the support uh, for the government increases significantly. I mean, I, they say that I don't support Tur Erdogan's uh, foreign policy. I don't support Erdogan's Syrian foreign policy, but I do support when Erdogan goes into Syria uh, to uh, to counter Kurds, PYD. I, I, I should not say Kurds, PYD. Uh, so... Uh, domestically, it's also something um, that makes uh, president more popular. Okay, well, thank you. So, friends, um, anybody wants to uh, jump on the floor for some questions, please? Well, may I ask a question? Go ahead. Uh, Colin Riddler. Yes, thank you so much. I thought it was an absolutely excellent talk and very, very interesting. Uh, a very specific question, which I think you've answered, is Turkey, you seem to be saying, will carry flying drones to Ukraine? That's a specific question. The broader mm -hmm. one is China. How does that affect the bilateral relations between Russia and Turkey, given that China has, hasn't it negotiated some recent deal with Turkey? Say again, the last Well, the relationship with, between China and Turkey has there not been a recent uh, negotiation or some agreement? I mean, I'm, I'm and the and the Belt and Road huh. policy. Okay. Uh, okay. Um, the first question is the drone uh, question, yes. and I think uh, one of the things that Turkey foreign policy, Turkey's political establishment, thinks that the Ukrainian war is benefiting them is Turkey's defense industry. Uh, Turkey's defense industry has become a global superstar. Yes. And, <laughs> yes. And, and this has been going on even before the Ukrainian invasion, uh, I mean, Russian invasion of Ukraine, uh, that Turkey has become one of the major producers uh, of uh, drones and was willing to sell whoever wants to get Turkish drones, right? Uh, Turkey doesn't have military conditionalities or democratic conditionalities. So if you wanna buy Turkish drones, you'll get them. Um, and in that case, uh, so that's the, um, true for the uh, Ukraine as well. Uh, but most important component here, Turkish drones are produced by Ukrainian collaboration. The engines in Turkish drones are Ukrainian, not the engine oh. motors. Uh, right. Where are so, they made? Where are they made in Ukraine? That I don't know specifically, and uh, I, I really don't know. Maybe the the, uh, the Turkish government has been thinking of uh, getting this uh, motors done in another country because of the conflict. I think there were alternative uh, proposals and plans uh, to do that. Uh, but uh, up until the uh, invasion, uh, there was a significant military collaboration, not just buying drones from Turkey, but producing them, uh, sort of um, uh, joint producing them. So Ukraine has been Turkey's really military partner in the last two, three years. And this is also related to this idea that Turkey has always very much concerned about Russian presence in the Black Sea. That's, mm -hmm. I would say, uh, one of the important components of the competitive dynamic between the two countries. When it comes to Syria, Middle East, Turkey saw Russia as a partner, but when it comes to Black Sea, Turkey saw Russia as an enemy that needs to be constrained and limited by the presence of NATO. Uh, so Turkey used to have, five years ago, uh, this regional uh, 
uh, regional, I don't know, I don't exactly remember the name of the party right now, but the regional uh, model, something, I mean, which goes like this, uh, the problems, the regional problems should be solved by regional actors, even in the Black Sea, right? Uh, not with, with the presence of uh, Europeans or the Americans. That changed after the Crimean invasion, not immediately, but maybe two, three years after. So Turkey asked more of NATO presence in the Black Sea because Russia became the Black Sea, the major, most important Black Sea popper um, in, in the last five years. And that was Tur Turkey before, lost it uh, and was very much aware of it. Uh, so uh, in terms of uh, Black Sea competitive dynamics, I mean, Turkey is really not a friend of Russia. Um, and that developed, that also helped uh, Turkey to the, to, um, uh, develop this military alliance with uh, Ukraine. And in terms of the China question, uh, Turkey and uh, Turkey has been getting a lot of investment aid, uh, development aid from um, Russia, from, uh, I, I'm sorry, from China um, lately, as the uh, European investment aid uh, withdrew from Turkey uh, for political reasons. Uh, it might come back because of the Green Deal that after Turkey signed the uh, Green Deal, I parse the agreement, I'm sorry. Um, but um, China has been a very important partner in building the bridges, roads, and, and all these yes. mega projects, airports of Turkey. But I've been hearing that China is withdrawing from Turkey too uh, because of the unpredictability of Turkey's political environment and all changing similar to the Western investment. And um, I mean, investment is investment, whether Chinese and, or Western investment, they want predictability, even authoritarian or democratic, but investment predictability, rules remaining stable. Uh, but I've been hearing that, for example, they invest in this port, uh, but the rules that govern port change overnight. Mm. And, and then they, withdraw. <laughs> so there is a lot of competition for Chinese investment in the region. And Turkey is not, a, I mean, that's not guaranteed for Turkey to attract that investment either. And this doesn't help. This uh, instability doesn't help really to attract more investment, either from China or from West or from America. It really doesn't, doesn't matter. I mean, uh, it, yes, and, and they, there is a uh, geopolitical component, of course, but there is an economic rationale as well. Yes, yes, and maybe Erdogan's eccentric uh, tax or, or economic policies about uh, interest rates and that. So yes. Yeah, I mean, there is a lot of economic volatility for any type of investment uh, right now. Mm, thank you. You're welcome. Okay, we have a, a question from Mehmet Ali Dikerdem, but I don't know if he wants to um, jump in himself. And uh, oh, oh, thanks. No, I, 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 it's just kind of occurred to me because um, this was one of the. But by the way, um, uh, Ojam, that, that was really. Uh, thank you very much. That was really, thank really you. great. <laughs> because it was interesting. Um, you, you, you touched all the bases, and thank you very much indeed, really. Thank you. Um, I mean, this, 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 the, the plane incident, I, I can't even remember when it happened, but I, I do remember... 2015. Yes, yeah. I do remember <laughs> it being a, a fairly kind of traumatic uh, event, because, I mean, Turkey went cap in hand to NATO and asked for protection. And then the, the Russians withdrew their um, tourists and... Uh, demands mm. for tomatoes and, <laughs> mm. and, and, uh, and, and insults were traded. Yeah, I think the dynamics were yeah. a bit different um, in 2014. Yeah. Uh, yeah. Turkey was um, I mean, completely not siding or supporting Assad, completely opposed to uh, Assad staying in Syria as the president, prime minister, as the main, main ruler. The Russians, right from the beginning, 
was out. So there, the policies of these two countries in Syria was completely different. And Turkey was more in line with the Western position uh, yeah. up until 2014 or so. Uh, that began to change with the rise of ISIS and American alliance with the PYD. Mm. And that also began to change with the uh, refugee flow to Turkey and the Western uh, indifference, let me say, to stop that inflow right. uh, yeah. by creating a zone or something like that. Uh, so you have a lot of grievances uh, mm. towards uh, the Western Alliance in, by 2014. And that also has domestic components too, uh, because now the Kurds in Turkey also aligning more and more with the Syrian Kurds. Remember mm. Kobani's, the Arbakir signs, uh, yeah. all these demonstrations in Turkey. And um, uh, so in 2014 and 2015, you still have the Western, Western and Turkey alliance, though, even with problems. Uh, that would change, um, that would begin to change in 2014-15. Uh, then I think the, I still don't know who did that uh, down of Jad, uh, maybe internal conflicts, maybe an accident, as they've been saying, maybe a sabotage, uh, we don't know. Um, and I mean, there's a lot that's not known uh, in that incident. Um, but after that, as you said, a year long of sanctions, economic sanctions, yeah. and Turkish yeah. economy really suffered from that sa sanctions. And at the end of that year, the relationship got better the, after the coup d'etat because Erdogan now thinking they are supporting PYD. They send, uh, I mean, they let the refugees come to Turkey, uh, the, thinking of Western allies, and now the coup. Uh, and they are, uh, so I, I have to have this, this other actor, uh, Russia, coming to my uh, help, supporting me, balancing uh, the power or of the West in, in, in the region, and also has a concept that we use omnibalancing, uh, which refers to the regime security, uh, to, to ally with the external actor that keeps your regime in power, uh, that will help uh, to keep your regime in power. Um, so all these uh, factors, the very so, I mean, in a year, everything is changed uh, in the opposite direction, going from this to this. <laughs> so, it, I mean, but you see the the, the rap, rapid rapid speed of the events in in that period still though. We, we're still paying the price for that period. Uh, to 2000. From Gizi, from Gizi onwards, from Gizi to 2015. I mean, that, that, is, exactly. that, is, that has to be yeah. unraveled. I agree. That two years shaped yeah. everything. <laughs> yes. Anyway, thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you. Um, we also have a question from um, Ferdus Intaj. Mm -hmm. um, and I don't know if he wants to jump in or if he wants me to read the question out. Um, you can read the question. There we go. Uh, thank you, Professor Evelyn Balta, for your wonderful thank presentation. You. Thank you. Um, uh, I learned a lot about Turkey from your, your presentation. In your presentation, you told like uh, Russia and Turkey has a, a flexible relationship in foreign relations. Um, sometimes they compensate each other, sometimes they partner each other, sometimes they confront each other. Mm -hmm. And they both have good economic relationships and Turkey uh, and Russia also has good economic relationship with Germany. Mm -hmm. So Russia has good economic relationship with both Germany and Turkey. So how do you differentiate the foreign relation dynamics between Russia and Germany and Russia and Turkey? Uh, well, Germany is... a uh... European power, <laughs> Turkey is not exactly uh, a, a EU country, a major EU country. So uh, championed the sanctions, uh, canceled uh, the uh, Nord Stream immediately, uh, something which I wasn't even expecting because uh, it was, a, I mean, multiple 
in your uh, project, uh, which has become very important in Germany's economy. Uh, it is still being criticized among the, as you all know, uh, by the, um, specifically by uh, the UK, uh, not being tough enough uh, uh, towards Russia and also by some other um, uh, Baltic countries uh, mostly, uh, who has this bitter history uh, with the Russian invasion and anxieties over uh, Russian invasion as the Russians and Turks have this Western anxieties. Uh, uh, Baltic has a worse history. I mean, this Russian invasion anxiety uh, historically is pretty much there. Um, but uh, Germany has a strong economy, not like Turkey. Um, Turkey's economy is really very bad um, in, the, the, in the, I mean, specifically those last year, uh, and does not have too much um, neither financial stability nor um, any other sort of economic uh, stability. Uh, so, uh, with so with that kind of economy, uh, it's not easy to uh, join to sanctions. Um, I would say. I mean, I, I would really. Uh, I mean, I'm wondering whether there is another government um, in Turkey. Probably they would do the same. And Turkey has this policy. Uh, which is one of the principles <coughs> of Turkish foreign policy, um, and always they always say this, we only join UN mandated sanctions. We never uh, join any third party mandated sanctions, and neither the EU nor this and that, not an EU member, so no, I, we won't do that. Uh, but Turkey is pulled towards Iran. Uh, they said that when Americans, that, that developed out of the American pressure uh, to uh, for the sanctions over Iran, and um, although that's a different and very difficult, complicated Hulkbank story, uh, I can come up with, but let's just leave that aside. Uh, but Turkey's principle is that just the UN mandated sanctions, no other sanctions, and in this case, uh, there won't be any UN mandated sanctions, so um, um, I don't know. Probably there will be, uh, uh, for example, uh, you'll have uh, an autonomy in terms of um, uh, key trading with Russia uh, in textiles, grains, um, and, and construction sector, this and that, which are vital crucial for your economy. Uh, but then probably you'll be expected to join the sanctions when it comes to um, military uh, or arms weapons. Uh, and this and that, um, if the war drags on. Um, and and most important problem, of course, what Turkey is going to do with its S-400s. So another question. So this trust between Turkey and Russia, does this come from that they have a like common major religion, Orthodox Christianity? Oh, no, why is there is that? I mean, Turkey has been very suspicious about uh, Russia's Orthodox Christianity because in during the coming from 19th century, Turkey Ottoman Empire had a lot of Orthodox Christian um, populations, and Russia uh, sort of supported um, um, their independence and, and created uh, lots of. I mean. Um, what I'm saying right now. Uh, uh, so there is this suspicion towards Russia as an Orthodox Christian power. Um, and um, that I don't think is not an important component. But both, I mean, I would say both leaders use religion um, as a political instrument in different ways. Um, uh, but um, I don't think that task comes from religion, vice versa. Thank you. Okay, friends, any more questions, please? May I ask one more? Go ahead. You mentioned uh, Turkey and the Black Sea. On what scale is the Turkish Navy? How big is it? I don't know. <laughs> I mean, uh, I really don't know. 
I mean, uh, do they have their ships? Presumably, they must have their own. Yeah, yeah, ships. sure. Yeah. yeah no, but, I mean, but I, mean, I don't sea. know how big is it, how many ships they have. This is this is an information I keep reading and I keep forgetting. <laughs> I mean, <laughs> so whatever I say will be in Korean. I, I do have the numbers, figures, specific numbers somewhere, uh, but I, I, it's not in my mind. I'm not on the top of my mind. Because obviously they have one in relation to Cyprus and descending and the disputes with Greece and the Cypriots there. Mm. Yeah. Yeah. Because there aren't NATO ships in the Black Sea at the moment, no. are there? No. No. So it is a Russian sea, really. At the it moment. is, yeah. But right. I don't know. I have to check that. Thank you. <laughs> Mm. Any more questions, please, from Floor? Okay. Uh, can you hear me, Craig? Go ahead. Yeah, fine. Okay. So, Evran, Chuck to Shikra Dedham for a wonderful uh, presentation. Much appreciated from a mosquito infested room in Alachata Chesme. <laughs> I had terrible trouble with the internet, which kept going, coming, and going. And, uh, mm -hmm. Found a mosquito spray now, uh, so I, I caught some of your presentation, but only the end part because I had to download the rest of Zoom. But I think Craig has is, uh, is recorded it as always. Um, some very, very interesting dynamics you mentioned there. Um, China was a very interesting one, but I think China's concern is very much economic uh, because they've been over lending all around the world deliberately. Mm -hmm. uh, and then when people can't pay back, of course, then the muscle comes right down sure, like a hard yeah. fist hammer. And there's also the other dynamic that religion is actually a very, very big one here because, of course, the Chinese and the Uyghur thing has been going on for some time. Whereas um, uh, Erdogan very much plays the Islamist card, as you very, very well know, mm -hmm. uh, which plays very well to his conservative supporters. And he's going more and more down that road. Uh, so that's that's a couple of points, I think, as far as China is concerned. Um, I can't. It's very difficult to see what will happen in the elections next year, whether the AKP fortunes will continue gradually sliding downhill, whether the CHP will be strong enough, because of course, if, if he is replaced in a fair and free election, it'd be very interesting to see then how his relationship with Russia comes on um, if there's a new leader. At the moment, I can't really see a leader, um, but... Uh, that that we'll wait to see but i'm sure you'll keep your ear very close to the ground on that one mm -hmm. um so many things we could discuss and i won't prolong it anymore because uh, you've you've had an excellent presentation and thank you very much i'll cash up on all the bits i missed uh, uh, online very difficult i had to re-download soon or something you know what the internet can be like in parts of turkey here but thank you so much i really thank appreciate you. it Do you, have you published any books uh yes um well my only book in english is the american passport which is oh, yeah. totally unrelated to the subject uh, but i have uh, books uh in turkish on turkish russian relations which is titled um neighbors in suspicion something uh -huh. like that excellent um, title <laughs> My, my wife, of course, is a Turkish national and my daughter speaks Turkish and English, so uh, I can order the book and they can translate for me. Mm -hmm. Once again, Chokta Shekhele Dalem Shahan, lovely uh, presentation. Thank you so much. Where are you, by the way? In Istanbul? In Istanbul. Yeah, right. Okay. <laughs> okay, Craig, back to you. Okay, friends. Um, any more? Any more from the floor? Well, in that case, all I can say is thank you very much, Evran, thank you. for a very thank interesting you. and informative um, presentation. Thank and, you for um, having me. And, and thanks for your time. And thanks, everybody, for joining as well. Um, so, till next time, shall we say, and uh, good evening from, from me. And, and um, take care and have a good summer, everybody. Bye. Thank you. Thank you. Bye.